Welcome to the next panel, Cram Books, the new cutting edge of comics, as said by me. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, I made a joke that I made the title to someone, and they're like, <laughs> why? I'm like, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And we have um, uh, Andrew Alexander, Ali Erico, uh, Angela Fanche. Uh, Vanch. Vanch, thank you. And uh, Max Huffman. Uh, and uh, I'm the moderator, my name is Rob Clow. And um, as the first intro, for those who are unaware of what CRAM is, it is um, a small press uh, publisher based in New York that uh, publishes things on Risograph. Uh, and it includes an anthology, and it is uh, on its fourth issue, which debuted I think this weekend, right? Or very recently? Uh, it was uh, like a month and a half ago, but it was, I think, one show before this. It wasn't. Yeah, yeah. so recently. It's recent. Um, and then both um, Ali and Angela have published full books with yeah. Cram as well. And um, the reason I put this together is because I really do think that this is an anthology and a company that like kind of capturing a certain spirit of the moment that I find interesting. So we're gonna talk to them and see how things, why Andrew is doing this thing and uh, how it all began. And we'll kind of start with this image of, um, yeah. <laughs> of the big issue, the weekly annual. And um, that was started by Andrew and Max. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Andrew. Yeah, and, and also Jack Reese, who, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll, because Jack did a ton of designing for this book. like Including the f cover. Yeah, that whole cover is really mostly Jack designed. Um, but uh, yeah, we, me and Max, I think all of us here, we all went to comic book school. Uh, uh, Ali, me and Max all went to School of Visual Arts, and Angela went to Parsons. Um, but I met Max in Gary's class, and he had a, a Jose Munoz's, uh, Joe's bar and he's like Gary I got Joe's bar and I was like can I see Joe's bar <laughs> anyway I, I really imposed friendship on Max and I literally uh, there was a, a knock on my dorm room door one night <laughs> and uh, Andrew and Jack were standing outside and asked if I wanted to make an alternative comics anthology with them. <laughs> as one does in comics yeah, that's what you do. You knock on doors. There, I was I was really surprised when I got to SVA that um, how few kids were kind of uh, interested in alternative comics, as, and um, especially because there are so many alternative cartoonists that came out of SVA in the New York scene of the the eighties and nineties, and and teachers too. Like, and I think that's why we we yeah. kind of felt that we had to find each other. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we did this anthology called Weekly, and the idea was that it was weekly, and we'd draw two pages every day. So the size was copying Oily comics at the time, right? Oily had the four and a, four and a quarter by five and a half, one sheet of paper cut in half, stapled. Yep. Um, and so it was really easy to make 100 of them, or th 300, maybe 300, so we each had 100. I think we did, yeah, yeah maybe like, so. And we did uh, we did 15 issues of that smaller format, um, and weekly. And it was, at one point, one brief moment, a weekly publication. A couple and, of weeks. <laughs> yeah, and then our senior year, we stopped doing the, the little ones, and we made this giant one. Yeah, it was like a joke. We were like, oh, we'll make the, the Marvel annual-sized one. And so this book is, like, the cover is silk-screened, the, the outside page is risographed, and then A.T. Pratt has a pop-up spread that, like, folds out, and we just kind of, like, we're seeing how far we can make a book, and... All there, the signatures are stapled in. Yeah, there was yeah. a 20-page tipped-in Gary Panner sketchbook that he yeah. was very kind enough to donate. Um, so clearly you weren't broken of the will to make an anthology, which is one of the most difficult. And I was. <laughs> yeah, well, you tapped out. So for some reason, Andrew was like, I, clearly I don't have enough of this self-punishment. No. <laughs> um, and uh, I think this is Cram 2? This is 3. 3, yeah. yeah. Um, and what kind of 
led to this idea of like, I want to be a risograph publisher now? Um, I was, so like before I went to SVA, like I was like a high school, like I had really bad grades in high school. So I went to community college and really the only art at community college that like connected with me was printmaking. So I did a bunch of silk screen and like lithography. And so when I came to SVA, I really like hunted down the silkscreen lab and I met David Sandlin and Pan Terzis who was my boss at the Rizzo lab. Um, but anyway, so I graduated and I worked for the school as a Rizzo printer and I just kind of became a printmaker again. Um, and so making a Rizzo anthology just kind of was just kind of there. It just kind of made sense. I had free access to print for, for seven years and it took me six years before I started the comics publisher or five years or something. So um, it just kind of made sense. I don't know. It wasn't uh, too like intelligent or like a scheme or like it was just like <laughs> I printed Rizograph and make comic, you know. And, yeah. and I guess the other thing is because everyone who I worked with and knew was in art books, like everyone was doing New York Art Book Fair and no one was just doing like SPX or cake or like rarely anyone who I knew who was Rizzo printing was doing that. So I was like, I want to do comics on the Rizograph. That's the full thought, I guess. That makes sense. Um, when you have been doing this anthology, um, were you, what in, in other anthologies, if any, or other editors, were you influenced by or did you seek input from? And what kind of goes into your choices for putting together an issue? Um, publishing wise, like there's always been like, Picture Box has always been like really exciting, like for me. Uh, my first SPX was like 2013, and I think I sat in this room and I listened to like a Frank Santoro panel. Um, but yeah, I've always really admired publisher vision, and I've always like really thought about that. But for the anthology, like truly, it's it's kind of just a gut thing. Like I, I ask a lot of people. Some people say no. Some people say yes. And so it's pretty organic. I don't really ask for specific things from people. Sometimes I do. Sometimes uh, an artist is kind of stuck, and they're my friend, and I feel like I have the good grace of like asking for a specific thing from them that I've seen them do like one time. You know, like the half finished comic, I'm like, oh, can you finish something like that that you just started or, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I never have a good answer for this. It's pretty organic. Like if you see that first issue, it's like, it's me and then it's Max and then it's our friend Cade who we went to undergrad with and it's Alex Laird and it's Claire Gunther who, who uh, Angelo published, was, was it Claire and Doggy D? No. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she's uh, my friend. But, <laughs> but, but Claire. But she's in um, Bernadette. Yeah, she is in Bernadette. She's like a really amazing cartoonist. So it just was, <clears throat> just kind of came together really organically. And I think someone reviewed it and was like, it's a New York comics anthology where it's all New York artists. And it wasn't meant to be like that, but it was just happened to be all New York artists. So, except me. I, except who? I was already h home. I was in the waste. You're still a New York artist. <laughs> learned a learned New Yorker. You, you can't get the stink off you. You can't get the stink off you. Um, I want to turn to Angela. I want to talk about uh, me and Knight was one of the first. Not the first, but one of the first non-anthology. No, hmm? It was the first. It was the first, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how did how did this come to be that you, you published with Andrew? Uh, what was that story? Uh, I don't really remember whether it's like chicken or egg. Can you remind me, Andrew? We, we like talked about it. So like I met Angela on my 25th birthday and it oh, yeah. for me it was important because I wasn't doing autobio comics yet. And it really like kind of gave me permission to, and I started making out of biocomics, and that kind of changed my thinking on like my own work. Our friendship gave you permission. Like, like I, I think I think seeing work that I was like, that I like was like auto bio work that I wasn't embarrassed by. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 <laughs> That gave me. I was like, yeah, I, there could be. You can do this. There's, there's a, there's something else here that I can. Do. Every, everyone can do bottle bio actually, and for it to be not as embarrassing as it can be. 
Yeah. So when you say embarrassing, let's hone in on that a little bit. <laughs> what do each of you mean by what is embarrassing on a bio to read and or to to write? I I think I said embarrassing as a substitute word for like destructive because I think there's a lot of times you can write out a bio and hurt your own life and like ruin relationships and and so there's like a lot of like I don't know. You don't have to name names. I'm just kind of like looking at you, the you know. We yeah. Auto bio is I don't know. It's like a dangerous subject sometimes. I don't know. It's weird. That's what I meant. What do you think, Angel? Oh, I, I thought you meant like when you read um, like an auto <laughs> comic, and then you go, whoa, uh, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, like it's not. It's like when you're like uh, meeting up with a friend. And like they're like telling you all these stories, and like not giving you like any in, and you just feel like you're like um, just there, and you're like listening to someone ramble, and there's like no point. There's like no point for you to be sure. there. There's like no in for you to like converse with. You're not able to connect um, in the conversation at all, and so you kind of like either dismiss it or you like. Um, feel kind of like cheated or like taken ba back from it. Like you're like, why am I your friend? Why am I, do why am I reading this? Um, what is the purpose? I don't really relate to it in any way. Or like, I feel alienated by you. <laughs> 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 and so like, I feel like when I think of like embarrassing, com like the word embarrassing isn't the right word. I just mean like, um, like autobio comics where you're not like able to connect yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah. Did you mean in the way of like, um, th like the other people you draw in the autobio comics are gonna get mad at you? Oh yeah. Like for being represented. Totally. And I feel like it happens, right? Yeah, it totally happens. It, yeah, it happens all the time. But some people are like, oh, please put me in. And I'm like, no, I don't want to put you in. You want to be in. I have people <laughs> in my life who are like, don't ever put me in your comics. Really? Like, yeah. Uh, me too. Yeah? Huh. I feel like I have less and less, but I don't know. The real and ones want to be there. The real, the real <laughs> yeah, that's ones, so true. The real ones are always there. Um, <laughs> My close friends are We went on a big there. tangent, but Angela had this autobio collection, and I think I pitched the idea, like I remember we sat at a bar and I was like, here, here's a mock-up, and I had the floppy stapled mock-up. I was like, see, you could be a perfect bound book with staples through it. Um, and we were like, it's like a diary, it's delicate, it has like the, the, uh, the Japanese uh, you, fold. I think you, uh, yeah, the French fold. Yeah, yeah, French fold, I, I always forget what it's called. The French flaps. No, it's like the Japanese stitch where it's like Oh, oh, oh I see what you're saying. The yeah, stab yeah. binding. Yeah. 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 Oh, Japanese stab binding, French yeah. fold. Yeah, French fold, French flaps. But anyway, we had, I had like the mock-up and I pitched it to Angela and Angela. I said no at first, I think. I think so. Why was that? Oh, um, I don't know. We're not supposed to be like something. It's not supposed to be like. Uh, it's just. Um, I don't know. I, it's it's different. I didn't. I never wanted to be like known for my autobio comics, but then I realized like it's okay to be. It's fine. Yeah. There's no. There's no like shame. It's not like. Sti there's no stigma. <clears throat> yeah. It's just like self. Yeah. I think I came around to it. Yeah, and I mean, like, I wanted to do because I wanted to make, like, the best presentation for your work or, like, a presentation that I felt, like, did your work justice, you know? So that was always my thought. Thank you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question for, for Angela is that after that, you know, you have become uh, an editor and putting out um, anthology, like, Burner Dad, which is fantastic. Um, what uh, what lessons or inspiration did you take from this initial experience of being published? Um, what kind of led you to kind of want to do a similar expression? Um, I was like going uh, through a hard time in my life. Like I felt really like like isolated um, and like not able to feel like I belong to any, like I had, I felt, I felt like I didn't know who my friends were and like, um, and I didn't know like what kind of people liked the same things I liked. Um, 
So then I pitched the idea of an anthology to my friend Katie, and also um, at the time Juliet Collet and um, uh, Claire Gunther. Um, and then it ended up just being me and Katie in the end. Um, but just like, because comics is so, lo like it can be so lonely, like, um, like you can just spend your whole, you can just spend your whole life like in your in the in a room drawing not talking to anyone um, and finish a comic that's totally possible um, so I wanted something that had more t that had more social engagement and I think that like an anthology requires like many people um, co-editing requires you to like work with other people so that was like why I did Bernadette what kind of artists were you looking for recruiting for it? Was it as organic as Andrew? Did you have a specific kind of like mission or aesthetic that you were going for? Yeah. You don't know no, which one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, what was the question? So, so the question was like, was, was the process organic, like the way that Andrew does it, or are you more sort of intentional about the kind of people you're recruiting or were you going for a particular aesthetic? And if you were, what was that? Um, uh, I don't really want to go into it, honestly. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like that takes away from the uh, actual purpose of the publication. If I were to explain it, I prefer like people to come to that on their own. I Just mean, like meeting a person. Yeah, no, that's that's like a totally fair answer. Um, you know, not showing. You don't want to talk about the scaffolding. Like it's obvious to people who get it, like who like see it, and then they'll come to the conclusions on their own. Um, and it's like quite obvious the what those conclusions can be if they're looking for that sort of thing. That makes sense. Um, let's move on to Ali, and. Um, what the, how did you come to work with, uh, with Andrew and what led to, um, to Froggy World? Um, well, I was like doing Froggy World for a long time just on the internet uh, by myself and kind of just started it as like a project for me and I posted it on my Instagram as I was doing it and I never kind of had any intention to make it into a book or anything, but then it just went on for a really long time, and then there were like a ton of comics um, that were like only on the internet, and I guess I knew Andrew from, we, we went to school together, but we didn't really know each other in school. Mm -mm. Um, I think Lauren I Weinstein talked about your work to me one time when I graduated. Yeah, I feel like because like Max said, there were so few people in our school who were going for like wanted to make alternative comics, like everyone just kind of knew each other, it was like a secret. <laughs> like all the teachers were like, oh, I see that you're like making these weird <laughs> comics, like here are all the other students who are doing the same thing. Yeah, you, uh, you're the ones that are before and the ones that graduated, and, and yeah. you should email them. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, how did, I think you reached out to me. Yeah, I think I reached out to you, You, I think you were, you were like, I'm ready to make a book. And I was like, yeah, I want to make a book. And it was pretty quick and organic. And we met a couple blocks, not a couple blocks, but like near my studio, I met you. And Oh, yeah. Yeah, because uh, you had um, my comic in the Cram Anthology. Yeah, that and too. And after that, too. Yeah. that uh, yeah, yeah, in Cram. It's a great photo. Like, it's really high res. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but yeah, in, in Cram 2, <laughs> Ali's <laughs> comic was the first comic in it. And I mean, like, uh, when I got it, like, like I think the thing that always I decide more on is like when I get the comics is like the order of the read I get really excited about. And Ali's comic was like, it's first. It has to be first. It is like that's a statement of purpose. It's like yeah, it's like it's 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 like I don't know. Um, Cram is always like I've always made work with the assumption that like like radical vulnerability or like being as vulnerable as possible and mm -hmm. open and honest is like 
just the most exciting thing you can do. You know, like I, I recently like called it grabbing the third rail, you know, like trying to like touch the truth as quickly and directly as possible. And I don't know, that comic does it so wonderfully. You know, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful comic alley. Thank you. Yeah. That, I mean, that's possible. something that um, I think Ali and Angela actually really have in common. And that's why I, I put both of them on a panel yesterday that's called warts and all, like raw, mm -hmm. and, and, and that, that's a really great description of like, it's not just that you're giving personal details or about what this mm -hmm. or that, but like very openly making yourself vulnerable, but yeah. almost in this matter of fact way. Yeah, like get, really getting to the heart of the matter, like why I need to say it and what I'm saying, just. And without like, the necessity of added melodrama. Mm -hmm. Like, this, it's enough to, like, just do and say the thing. Um, Ali, when you were putting this book together, did you have an idea specifically of what you wanted it to look like um, in terms of, like, design, things like that? Or is that something you left to, to Andrew? Um, a little bit. Like, I, I wanted it to be, like, almost square because the comics are square. Um, like I'll, I'll I'll say that Allie designed like ninety nine percent of it. I had like very like little like oh it should be about this size maybe if you want square maybe it should be a little taller than square like things like that. But it yeah, wasn't. you knew like the paperweights. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love talking about paper. <laughs> I I kind of had no idea what it was gonna look like, and then the cover was like the last thing I did, and I sent you a cover that looked like shit, and I was like this is the cover, and then I like it. We were like, that's not the cover. And then I did yeah. this cover really fast, and I really like it, how it turned out. Yeah, I think that the inside page, one of the inside pages was possibly going to be the cover, and I was like, I don't think it's quite the cover yet. I think the first cover I came up with was, like, I just grabbed a bunch of um, images, like, from the comics, and I put them together on, and I, like, filled it in in, like, Photoshop, like, red and blue and yellow, and it, like, looked terrible. <laughs> But <laughs> this one uh, looks great, and I think it looks great with the printing too. It, it was really eye-catching when initially we initially looked at it. Um, as, I was curious, as a student of Warren's, um, what kind of insights did you get from from her for your own career? Because work isn't exactly like hers, but it's like like I said, there's like a sympathy between your work and hers? When I met Lauren, it was like, it felt like, well, first of all, everyone was telling me like, you have to take Lauren's class because you're just like her. And so when I met her, it was, it was like immediate connection. Like, I feel like we both just really got what, she really got what I was doing. And I was like, wow, your work is so cool. I didn't really know her before that. Um, and, just like, I don't know, talking to her and like seeing what her like process is like. And uh, she would like always share with us, like she was writing, she's writing a long book right now. And like, she would talk about what she's going through, like writing it um, and like, yeah, the process and stuff. And just seeing like that as kind of like, a, like this is how you can work on something um, was really helpful. Um, yeah. Um. Yeah, that's, that's great. And then I know she actually came out to Philly for the debut of your book at, yeah. at Partners and Sons. She, she came out to, we, we threw a show for, yeah. in New York. We threw like, how many bands? We had like five? Yeah, we had like, or it was like three bands and like five comics readings. Yeah. But we threw like a whole show and like she came from Jersey out to the show and it was amazing. And she was like, oh my god, there's I was like so scene. happy to see her. It was so cool. It was really <laughs> cool to have her. Yeah. Also, um, uh, <laughs> uh, another thing Lauren uh, did for me was I would watch her dog, and she would <laughs> let me just stay in her house in New Jersey uh, while dog sitting, and it was like doing a studio retreat. <laughs> that was so awesome. <laughs> did you get her to interact with her kids? Uh, yeah, a little bit. But when I dog sat for her, it was just like me in the house alone. So it was like, uh, 
It's like it was like a residency kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, Angel, I was kind of wondering about you at SVA and what that experience was like for you. If you had kind of, did you have similar kind of? Um, I'm sorry, with the persons. Yeah. Um, uh, did you have similar kind of mentors there, like figures in your life, kind of influence what you're doing? Uh, I went to Parsons for illustration, hmm. so, um, but there was a there was a lot of um, focus on visual narrative, um, and in my stu uh, when I was there. Um, ben Catcher is the head was the head of the. Department. Yeah, Ben Catcher was the head um, in my last two years, um, and that like kind of form like some prof some cartoonists profess were hired as professors yeah um like josh bear i didn't take josh bear's class but he was around um but jordan was a real really big yeah for you. jordan isip uh he was like he's an illustrator um but he was a he was a mentor for me um yeah it was mostly my Friends, I think. I think my friends were a big part of why I did what I did. Yeah. Um, we, when we were in Weekly, there was other like rival gangs, you know, like <laughs> other little. And Angela had a rival college gang. You make it seem like we were like in a cure or something. It was <laughs> a <little> felt. <laughs> like we were on our motorbike. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There were tussles, tussles, all on the page. <laughs> that actually is a question I was just about to ask, which was being a young artist, being in New York, and this is kind of for all of you, and like also wondering, like for Max, because you're saying he's a New York artist, what kind of impact did New York have on you, both in terms of the peers and the city yourself and the things that you saw, and how much of that can, continues to resonate with you? We'll start with Max. Sure. Um, I mean, it was huge. I came from a really a small liberal arts college town in North Carolina, and um, obviously I had my mind blown immediately. And and um, the the thing that stuck with me most um, was coming to New York and learning about this like that there was this DIY culture, you know, there's this block in Brooklyn that had um, like all these DIY venue living spaces, just one after the other, 285 Kent, Death by Audio, Glasslands, yeah. and going to shows there and uh, just like- Show paper. Be, yeah, yeah, show paper was a, a, a newspaper with alt cartoonists on the cover. And I, I'd go to shows at these places in Brooklyn on this block and um, just I, w I was really like this is so utopian this is amazing and then um, Vice Media bought that entire block and knocked down all those uh, <laughs> uh, DIY venues <laughs> and built an office building and now that office building has been abandoned <laughs> by, uh, because Vice Media itself is, has been skeletonized so just like <laughs> Coming to New York, seeing these these systems play out and how they, uh, you know, quick, quick cannibalize turn themselves quick and turn to skeletons. the speed at <laughs> yeah. which, yes, the the stop motion fox decaying, um, <laughs> was was the biggest uh, takeaway for me. And I I was uh, obviously the first one to wash out <laughs> of the city. Um, I I don't know that I could just hang with that, you know. How about you, Antoine? I'm from New York. I grew up in Queens. Uh, um, go Mets. <laughs> <laughs> My checks are Mets. You, yeah, you, yeah, your checks have Mets on them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, it's obviously it's all you ever knew. Yeah, I never really left. I lived in Philly for three months really recently because I was like, I couldn't find a place um, because it's gotten really expensive now. Yeah. Um, on the car ride over here, we were just talking about how you can't really find a room, even with roommates um, below 1,000 or 1,100. Um, but yeah, I don't like I don't know where else to go. How about you, Allie? Um, yeah, uh, I 
moved to New York when I was 18 to go to college at SVA, and before that I lived in New Jersey, and, but the part of New Jersey that's like very disconnected from New York, so I wasn't there much before I moved there. And it kind of like, I mean, I love New York so much, like it was interesting having those like formative years like in the city instead of being at college, which is kind of like a controlled environment, like you're kind of just thrown into yeah. like living in New York um, instead of being on like a college campus. So that was awesome, uh, but it was also like such a struggle because I don't have a lot of money. And so I had to like work, I would, like work so much at like food service jobs and stuff like that. And uh, that is like inspirational in its own way, but it's also like, you know, it kind of fries you um, so uh, the city like definitely inspires me every day. I don't think I could live anywhere else just because the density of like things that happen is so high. <laughs> like you just walk outside and like you have 10 different stories to tell from yeah. like walking to the deli. So it sounds like New York has like the, the density makes everything a narrative or mm -hmm. make the narratives look just like e easy to discover. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I say. Yeah, I, I, I moved from California. I was lived in a suburb of Los Angeles. Um, and my first SPX was 2013. I would see like the photos on like Facebook cause I, I wasn't on Instagram in 2011 or whatever. And so when I moved to New York, the, what I moved in August, the September, I hopped on a bus down to DC, but like that was why I moved to New York was I wanted to be on the East Coast where it was like going to different cities was accessible and easy where, right, San Francisco from Los Angeles, it's a six and a half hour drive if you're really good at driving and fast, um, but otherwise it's like an eight hour drive, like just everything's so spread out. Phoenix is, you know, like five or six, seven hour drive, so. Geographically, it was just like the East Coast made so much more sense to be, and it was just so much exciting. And being in New York, you know, I've been there 11 years, and it's been uh, exhausting, but very, you know, it's kind of informed my work ethic and how I make work and how I approach making work. Um, yeah, don't know. So you say it's 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 exhausting because of like the pace, but do you find that like? motivates your work ethic, be part of like this? It, it fully drives everything I do in an unhealthy way, yes. Hustle grind set Wake over up. here. Yeah, I'm all about that grind set. It's kind of like, go ahead. For, sometimes for me, like if I have a lot of time off and I'm not doing anything, like I can't find motivation to like make art, like because there's nothing going on. But if I'm like so tired and I've worked every day this week, I'm like, <coughs> that like burnout state is really like conducive to yeah, I need to make it work. Stuff. I need to work. Yeah. I have to, I have to, I have to finish the drawing. Yeah. I'm like obsessed with like trying to figure out what's the best way to live in New York. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> it's yeah. like, that's like my, I'm conditioned to uh. like, like I need a, I, I need the best kind of job. I need the, like, not, the, not even like the best kind of job, meaning like what makes the most money. Like, I mean, like, I need a, a kind of job that can, like, suit my Your lifestyle, lifestyle. Yeah. yeah, like, so that I can still draw, but then also, like, live um, in the here. Best city in the world. In the best <laughs> city in the world. Yeah, and, like, where's, the, what, like, what combination of things, like, allows for that? Yeah. It's like a game. <laughs> I guess the question is, like how a game. sustainable is this? That's a, that's a great <laughs> question. And that's not really a, a good answer. Um, what, what was the question? How well, sustainable is this? This kind of like we'll we'll, we'll, we'll let you know grind. we'll let you know when we figure it out. Yeah, because um, all of you are under thirty, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. thirty one. Yeah, I'm twenty seven. Yes, yes, we're yes. all thirty. <laughs> I'm twenty two. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Uh, I want to talk about a couple other projects. Yeah. Um, tell me about uh, Ecotown. Ecotown. Um, I went to community college with my friend Ray. He's a painter, and I mean, this is like also kind of like kind of the the nice thing about New York is people and you meet, end up meeting people that you would have 
not met in a different place and you end up in the same city and you're like, oh, we both moved together, we should hang out. Um, but we both went to SVA and we both went to the same community college and we both took the same illustration teacher, Rick Osaka, in community college. And then when we moved to New York, we're like, oh, we'll meet. And so we've been friends for like a decade. But he had this idea to do a sketchbook uh, anthology. So a sketchbook book. And so we did a book called I Forgot to Draw Yesterday. Um, I think it's in the slideshow, yeah, but, but maybe. Um, there but it is. It's a, it, he has a moleskin collection. And since I knew him at, uh, at community college, he had moleskins. So he has probably like 300 moleskins. So he has a moleskin kind of like for every month of his life. He'll draw and complete it. And they fit in like this really nice. Anyway, so we were going through it and we we're like, okay, we'll make a book on it. And it was the beginning of the second year of Cram. And I kind of, the beginning of Cram was like, I want to make really difficult comics and difficult books. And at that time, I wanted to try and like push and see what I can do. And this was like the book that I was working with Ray on. And so we scoured hundreds of his sketchbooks to get together the material and then. My friend is a graphic designer, and we worked with them. And there was maybe like 20 or 30 iterations of the cover, and I kept rejecting it, and like, no, 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 no. So it was like an attempt at being a little bit bigger than I was. Um, and then after we did that, Ray's like, I want to do something like what you've been doing with Cram, and that's where Ecotone comes in. So Ray edited this, and it's a collection of uh, contemporary artists, but it's their drawn work or like focusing on drawing. And so a lot of them, a lot of the pieces are like massive paintings. They're like two foot by three foot paintings that are printed six inches by eight inches risograph. And you lose a lot of like texture and a lot of like the colors are a little bit different. But the project was m not about reproducing artwork, but making a new piece of artwork from the artwork, you know. So it was really making like an art book and not just um, a book of paintings because we, we had talked about like, we're not gonna put the artist names on it or like the titles of the work or like context for the work because it's not about, you know, like selling paintings through a book. It's about, you know, this, this different scene, right? Like, and this is like painters that Ray knows. And, you know, um, in the first cram, Stepan, Stepan Tarek is, He's, he's the first like inside comics to one page, but he's like a really successful New York painter. He doesn't really make comics, but he was in Strip Burger a bunch of times when he was in um, uh, Croatia, because he's from Croatia. And so, um, yeah, it's, you know, like I've always kind of, even, in, even when we were doing weekly, it's always been about like art and comics are kind of like the same thing. Like that's always been, and even the Bernadette anthology, I think in some ways, arts and yeah, comics. Yeah, fine arts in the. It's it's the same thing. So, it's kind of the thought. So you said you're looking at picture box. Did you ever look at um, Kramer's Ergot for any? Yep. Uh, I graduated from a master's degree. I worked at the school, so I got to go to SVA um, in 2022, and my thesis advisor was Sammy Harkum. Oh. Um, and truly, we didn't talk that much about anthologies. It was mostly about like how to write a scene, moments of like it was truly just about comics. But a lot of those ideas really informed uh, Cram as it was starting off. Because when it started off, it was the Angela book, and I was making it in the my MFA studio, like by hand, and I had it like at a full ten by ten cube, and everyone in the studio was getting mad at me. Like, cause I took like four studios. I had my studio where I drew, I had my studio where I slept, I had my studio where I assembled the book and watched TV. <laughs> um, but it was COVID, so, you know, there was less, less yeah. students. Um, um, the final one, the thing I asked about is you mentioned David Sandlin. David Sandlin, um, he's the man. Uh, he truly is and has been around forever and published. You know, he's, uh, I mostly associate him with Blab. Totally. Um, and you said that's someone you work with. How, to, how did this project come out? Um, I was working at the Rizzo Lab, and he had this book, Belfast, um, that he would commission me to print. And so the first issue I printed just as a commission job and on and on and on. So this is the sixth issue. And at a certain point, I was like, you know what? I should just publish it. Like, I don't know why I'm you know, like giving you such bad or like taking such bad rates, I'd rather just publish it. 
And we weren't printing that many. It was maybe like 150 each time and then reprinting 150 each time. So there's the first few issues, there's maybe like 200 of each of them. Um, yeah. And so this one, we did a run of like 350, something like that. How many are there now? There's six. He has the seventh one finished, and he has the eighth one. It's an 18-part series. <laughs> of course it is. Of course it. I mean, I mean, like I'm gonna be printing it with him for you know, the next decade. So. There the we last go. thing I'm gonna ask you all about, um, kind of this photo. Yeah. This is a this is a reading. Cram as much of anything. You're, you're saying, you're taking advantage of New York. It's you deliberately create these scenes, these events. Yeah. How important is that to you as an artist and a publisher that you're not just creating a thing, that you're creating a community? Yeah. They, none of them were here and they're all like whispering because they're like, what is where, this? Where am I? Where is the that? hell is this? <laughs> um, <laughs> I do a lot of shows. Like the second year, I did like close to 20 shows. And so I went back to go see my sister had a baby in Los Angeles or like outside of Los Angeles. And so I organized a show the same weekend as the the Los Angeles Art Book Fair because I was pissed I didn't get in. So I did it at <laughs> Skylight Books. Um, but this was a reading that we organized at Skylight Books and I got Pat Rooks and, um, and Fifi Martinez and Alabaster Puzo to read with me and they're all in the photo. And yep. this was just a reading that we organized. But um, yeah, I, I try and organize That's events, fun. but it's not like my strength. Um, but I still try and do it. It's never like I share a studio with Frog Farm with Alex Laird and he's his publisher is kind of built around his readings and his performances but um, it's not really the focus for me and when I get to do it and I get to bring community together and different communities and different people who don't really know each other together is always really exciting yeah um, we have time for a few questions if anyone is interested and if you want to ask a question we have mics on either end of the room, as I would ask if you wouldn't mind coming down to there. Right. We have our first person. And, and Skylight Books rules, that's Skylight Books, just so, for reference. Yeah. All right, so is, is it on? I think, tap okay. it. Um, I was really curious to hear you talk about being a printmaker at the beginning of this. Mm -hmm. Um, I, when we were in weekly, the risograph came to SVA and it was like the biggest fucking deal. <laughs> it was the biggest deal. And we printed the dumbest two color comic you've ever seen. But, but it was like, I think, I think it's just really, it's like, if you were to make your own comic, it's like, before that it was Kinko's and a, a black and white Xerox. And it was, it sounds so crazy that there was no colored printer before that you could afford, but it kind of is that unless you buy a colored printer and you refill the inks. And if you ever print a hundred, you'll find that it's like it's like four to seven hundred dollars just to like refill inks. The inks are so expensive. So it I think it was just like an accessibility thing and now it's become kind of a uh like a high high like a status thing and it I don't I never thought about it like that so I was it was always kind of like the cheapest easiest way to make color work there's such little money and so much relative labor in making comics that I yeah think people um, correctly see print printmaking um, you know comics and comics adjacent artists see it as a, a way to make uh, a little more money for a little less work um, yeah. And, you know, and it's a nice object and it's something that people can parlay into a, um, a real job more easily. You know, I, you see people who start out as like, you know, printing band merch that become screen printing businesses, sure. or, you know, and I, um, unfortunately I worked for one of those right after, uh, school and completely destroyed any yeah. love for we, printmaking. We, we were doing such good silk screens, and then you just silk screened a 
5,000 band shirts and you hate it now. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just reclaiming <laughs> screens and, and folding 800 shirts for elementary schools. And so, um, yeah. In New yeah. York? No, this is back in North Carolina. <laughs> I also got so burned out on printing. Any, I took like, the Rizzo class at SVA, and I was so confused and like could not handle it. I was not drawn to it, and I didn't print like anything while I was there. I never finished anything. Um, but then I worked at a bunch of screen printing shops, and I, now printing is just so like I don't want to print anything ever again. So I was really glad that Andrew did the physical act of printing the books. Yeah. I, I like printmaking. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're next, over here. Oh, I'm next? Yeah. Something about the sheer structure of this room gives me stage fright. It's sure. Like, but it's terrifying in here. <laughs> scanners. I'm and Andrew's you. comparing the movie Scanners. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. <laughs> 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 I know you guys are like doing a lot of curation work and also a lot of uh, creation work when you're talking about your friends. Do you think that you could you have the, a finger on the pulse of like what the new up and coming comics are hungry for, or like the kind of stories you're gravitating towards? Uh, I, I I'm going to use this to to say like I was nominated for the best series, but I want to talk about Floyd Tangeman's anthology Jaywalker, and Jaywalk, Jaywalk, you're right, um, and Jaywalk. I talked to Floyd and he was like, "Oh, you're Andrew. Oh, you. Oh, you made you made the Weekly anthology. Oh, I saw that when I was 15. I, uh, and I, I, it was like we made this anthology and it was had like 200 people buy it. Maybe like we didn't make that many. And the fact that he saw it and influenced what he's doing is kind of like why we do it. Um, no, I don't have a finger on the pulse. I, I, I don't know. I, I do like the old crankies and I, I do like the new weepies." I, I, lo I love them both. Um, I think we really uh, perhaps tried to blaze our own trail of the young crankies. <laughs> young crankies. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but young crankies, everyone's like, you know, it's like a hipster thing, right? What? But, but like, <laughs> but like, I love a young weepy. Give me the e give me the emo kids too. Yeah. I love. I'm, I'm an I'm an emo kid through and through. You know, that's what I'm. I'm from. I went to high school in Pomona. It's an emo capital of the world. Anyway, I don't have to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say you're talking about that with Floyd. It's like the old um, Velvet Underground quote, like in the early years, only 200 people bought their records, but every single one of them formed their own band. Sure, sure. And over here. Hi. Yeah, sorry. Um, oh, I can't tell. Is this thing on? I we don't think it you. is, but we, I can hear you. Okay. I can just enunciate. <laughs> yeah. But, um, Sure. Is a maybe dead legacy that you have to take up. What what does it mean to you to inherit alternative comics publishing when decolonization, not revolution, is the like political call of the age? I I will admit I don't think that much like that deeply into it, but I do think about the fact that print is like it is truly a radical act right like printmaking and making work is like it's just a it's a radical act you print the message um i i did a printmaking semester at sva in cuba and it was like we were like the first americans in cuba in like 30 years or something but like we we're printing on these litho presses and the litho presses they were like these were the presses that like like they're print, printing the communist manifestos on like the, like they've been around for hundreds and hundreds of years and they were like there's only they don't have any more presses it's just these presses um and that always kind of stuck with me that it's like 
you know, there's like a privilege and like a responsibility in printing. And so I don't take it lightly, but I also don't, you know, I don't tie myself down with the thought of it. Like it should be, everyone should be able to print and everyone should do printing and everyone should get their, their comic out. And um, I don't think you have to wait for someone's approval to make the thing that you need to make. Um, yeah. Yeah, and as far as the term alternative comics itself, it's kind of just like a shortcut or a um, marketing non label at this point, just yeah. to say this is not, not Deadpool. Marvel. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's just kind of all it is. Yeah. Cool. Did that answer the question? I don't think it did, but. Sort of. I, I'm, I guess I, it's a very open question. Yeah. I, I want to know what your political imaginary is from like the greatest city. Sure. Built in, uh, hollowed out everything. So the the political imagination of what uh, you are doing is going to do to the world, and whether you think it's going to do anything. That's what I'm curious about. I like. I, I have no utopian vision or anything. Like truly, what drives Cram is this idea that like honesty, and like in some ways kindness. Right. Like it's. I think in some ways, honesty is kindness. It just makes things better. It makes things easier. It makes everything better. It makes everyone happier. It creates an understanding easier. It makes the work better. So everything is kind of pulses through that thought. Yeah. That's a great note to end on as um, we are at our time. Thank you so much for everyone at CRAM for this panel, and thank you everyone for coming out. Thanks, Rob. Yeah.